Hello. My name is Vanessa Maydu. I am Communications and Knowledge Exchange Specialist for SEBI Livestock, the Center for Supporting Evidence-Based Interventions in Livestock, based at the University of Edinburgh. Welcome to this Livestock Data Summer Session. So Livestock Data for Decisions Community of Practice, LD4D, has been hosting a, a series of learning events to showcase the work of our members. Um, and we've been offering unique insights into tools, techniques, and opportunities. These one-hour sessions are aimed at researchers, project implementers, industry and funders who work in livestock development. Today we welcome Dr. Dan Smiranda of the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO Hub. He will give us an inside look at how his team is conducting a cattle census in South Sudan using satellite technology. Dan has a PhD and postdoctorate in theoretical particle physics, which involved simulating grand unified theories and extra dimensions with the aid of machine learning and social evolutionary algorithm. Uh, Dan is interested in using adaptive, adaptive algorithms, machine learning, and Monte Carlo simulations in gaining insights from new data. He joined the FCDO Hub in March of this year, and he's joining us from Glasgow today. So welcome, Dan. Um, a quick note on the format today. So Dan will give a 20-minute presentation, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q&A in plenary. So anytime during the session, during the presentation, you may type your questions or comments in the chat, and we will get to those uh, later on in the session. Now, before we begin, I wanted to pop up a little poll just to get to know who's in the room. So um, the question is, why are you here today? And the options are, I need better livestock census data to do my work, or I need new ways to count cattle. Some people might just be curious. And if you have another reason, uh, select that, and then you can type your other reason in the chat. So I'll give you a moment to fill out the poll. Okay, 10 seconds to finalize your choice. Okay, so I'll end the poll there. Last chance. Almost everyone's voted. Okay, so I would say, so 55% are just curious. Uh, there's a small group of you, 21% uh, who are looking for new ways to count cattle. 16% uh, need better data on livestock uh, numbers. And in terms of other reasons, let's see. So um, someone, Doug McNeil at EOLAS, sorry, I don't know what that stands for, have been undertaking animal census in Scotland for red deer using similar approaches. So that's interesting. Um, Mark Harrison writes uh, that they're working on provenance and sustainability claims in land restoration. So it's a similar. Um, issue. Great. Okay, so hopefully that that gives us a little bit of insight into who's here and what the interests are before we begin the presentation. So I'll stop sharing that. And I will simply hand over to Dan now. Cool. Cheers, Vanessa. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dan. Um, as Vanessa introduced me, I'm an ex theoretical physicist and I work for the ONS for the data science campus and I'm part of the FCDO data science hub and today I'm going to be talking to you about the work we've been doing about estimating cattle, uh, cattle camp numbers and cattle numbers in South Sudan using satellite imagery. It, this is in collaboration with my colleagues and my my managers, uh, my colleagues Thomas uh, Wilson, Joseph Griswell, uh, my managers Tim Harrison, uh, Tom Wilkinson. It, I'm mostly the technical side of these things, uh, so this talk will be mostly uh, around the technical sort of side, but I do touch on other things like ground truth data, needs, and so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, just, just keep that in mind, and please keep in mind that this is still ongoing work, and we're still uh, 
ironing out a lot of things and exploring a lot of avenues because it's quite a, a challenging and a complicated problem when you actually break it down. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's kind of get going. Hopefully you can see my screen okay. Uh, so this is the outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to talk about briefly why do we need a cattle sense since how it's done. We're going to look at the detection methodology and the data that we're using to kind of estimate, to, not to estimate, to find the locations of cattle counts in South Sudan. And then we're going to look into the current estimation methodology. We're going to talk about what did it work and what we're kind of looking into right now with Monte Carlo's and numbers estimations. Uh, we're then going to move on to the current work, the limitations, the pros, the cons of what we're doing, and future plans that we're planning to do with the data, with the code base and so on. And then again, we're going to finish with like some applications and some conclusions at the end to kind of just wrap everything up nicely. Okay. Uh, so let's start on this up. The need for a cattle census, right? First one, why do we need the cattle census in South Sudan? Uh, just to begin with, look, cattle farming is a massive and important uh, part of the South Sudanese economy, but it is very poorly understood. Uh, where the last cattle census was done in 1970, and the numbers since are based on a extrapolation uh, from that sort of thing. It's just a linear extrapolation. So you can imagine that the error bands are quite nasty after 50 years of extrapolating. So the estimates are considered quite inaccurate with that, I think. Uh, so you can then ask why just not do a traditional census and as I'm sure as you're going to be much more aware than I am, uh, there are certain risks associated with a traditional census, especially in South Sudan, which has conflicts ongoing. It, it's difficult to accomplish. You have security risks for surveyors or pastoralists and sharing their details. And similarly, the traditional way of flying drone and UAVs on the ground, you would need operators to capture images and commission aeroplane flown imagery is even expensive to kind of have a more detailed by hand sort of a, a numerical, uh, not numerical, but analytical or computer vision approach, but that would rely on high res imagery. Uh, so the point is kind of then why should you use satellite imagery? It's it kind of just dumps, jumps down to two reasons. One, there's availability. Uh, commercial satellite imagery is quite widely available and you can have high resolution images from all countries in the world and they're quite easy to find and access with uh, providers like Planet or Google. I kind of just furnish you this sort of stuff out of the bat, so it's not hard to come across. And the second one is affordability and speed. It's a fast and cheap method of producing a model based estimate with a few assumptions that we're I'm gonna kind of talk to you in a bit. Uh, but yeah, it's basically you trading off these sort of things for precision, but for affordability and speed. So uh, let's look about the detecting methodology and the data that we're using for this sort of stuff. Uh, the idea or the proposed method is to use different spatial resolutions. And what we're having as a pipeline is the idea of progressing from low to medium to high resolutions in terms of satellite images in which each one of the resolutions has some sort of specific role that it's accomplishing. Uh, the low resolution one is there to predict cattle count locations and perform rough estimates in terms of the Monte Carlo stuff, as we're going to see further down along the line. Uh, this is then fed into the medium resolution pipeline, or is supposed to be fed in the medium resolution pipeline, where we determine if the cattle counts are in use by uh, analyzing a time series uh, sort of data that comes with the medium resolution stuff to see if the cattle counts are in use. Uh, and lastly, this has progressed to the high resolution stage where for the state cattle counts, uh, we want to further refine our estimates and further validate the, the truth that those cattle counts actually contain cattle and are being in use. Uh, so the current workflow and the focus of this talk is gonna be around the low resolution stage. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through how we detect cattle camps, uh, why they're important, and how we tend to, what we're thinking, or what is the current method in estimating the numbers associated with these things. So uh, the low resolution stuff, effectively, you can think of it as finding a needle in a haystack. 
if your haystack was two dimensional and your needle is two dimensional as well, well, kind of is. Uh, so it's basically you can you need to find a needle in the haystack if it's just on a sheet of paper, uh, and you can only look at things. Uh, so this basically involves computer vision. Uh, it's the idea that we're trying to find features in our landscape and get our computer to detect them. It, this implies supervised learning in the sense that we tell the computer what it's supposed to look for. So in this sense, is is these uh, circular like uh, dry brown areas that show up in vegetations. Uh, and effectively, we train a model uh, based on a U network or a, a convolutional neural network classifier or a random forest uh, to then uh, classify and produce a map that relates to these sort of heat maps that you see on the left-hand side that effectively tell you that with high probability, these regions contain CalCamp regions. Uh, so the technique employs image segmentation to identify these regions in the landscape. Uh, and this is the reason why we kind of do this is that is quite fast and efficient. Uh, we've employed a escalation algorithm that basically as a two-stage uh, process, where which has a rough scan and a high uh, high fidelity scan, and depending on the results of the first one, they're fed into the second one, and that's what you're seeing on the left hand side is the filtered out uh, confidence uh, threshold associated with this sort of stuff. Lastly, uh, this sort of stuff is is underpinned by scaling. So in the sense that we've implemented this in TensorFlow, so for any of you that are familiar with machine learning, TensorFlow is the default, uh, well, not the default, but it's the community, widely community used uh, uh, library that is done by Google. Uh, and the very good thing about it is that it scales very nicely with computational resources. So if you can afford a bit more uh, computer power, this the code that we're writing is quite nice for that because it just scales up and reduces the complexity of what you're trying to do. But in a nutshell, this entire thing is, you're effectively looking at the landscape and you're trying and you're producing these maps that contain high probability areas uh, for where the camps are most likely to be. And this is based on human labeled training data. Uh, with this in mind, we still need to estimate how many cows we have, right? We're not counting the cows individually, but and we're going to see in a second why we're not doing that and why we want an estimate. The main reason is effectively on these high-res satellite images uh, that are widely available, which in our case are the 0.5 meter per pixel resolutions. Individual animals are very difficult to discern, where this is effectively what you're seeing, is just a bunch of white dots. So the issue with this is that you could, in, in principle, write something that classifies and counts these white dots, but because it's such a common traits along the landscape, you would just be, you would be overestimating quite badly and you would be struggling quite a lot to kind of just deal with these things. Uh, not to mention that the cost of the high res satellite images is going to blow out of proportions quite fast because you're, uh, you're counting, you would be doing this for the entire landscape of the country, which is, which is massive. So your cost would just be through the roof. Uh, the solution is to then look at cattle camps at this low resolution stage, uh, because cattle camps tend to contain a decent estimate of the population, a decent percentage of the population. And then, as I kind of mentioned previously, you kind of escalate it through these stages and you can use the high res stuff to kind of further validate what you're doing. Okay. So the question is, how do we, how do we estimate these numbers in, the, in these sort of cattle camps? And the sort of approach that we've kind of implemented is this Monte Carlo simulation. Effectively, we're trying to simulate how many cows can I fit in, in a square where you're just taking one cow and you're just throwing it at a 2D plane. Uh, you've got some parameters like how big the cow can be, how much does it vary, and what's the orientation of the thing. And you do it over and over again, and you repeat these simulations, and you effectively infer a cow density probability distribution function. Effectively, you, you know you've got some sort of function that tells you how do cows tend to pack and how dense is that sort of packing if you've done this uh, simulation over and over again, right? Uh, with this, we can now look at these cattle camps. So say we have this sort of cattle camp and we've come up with some sort of metric to 
delimit this sort of camp into different regions that correspond to different uh, densities. Uh, these regions are very irregular, as you can see, and can have holes inside of them, uh, which effectively just showcase that this method can be very, very powerful and is quite extendable. Uh, with these regions in mind, uh, we can break down these regions into triangular subpieces. So to get these sort of uh, tessellations that you see over here, you sample from the associated uh, distribution function, the, that density that I mentioned, and this is, and then you color these tiles uh, according to that sort of uh, sampling. And as you can see, it's the uh, color bar that effectively just denotes how density varies within these cattle camps. So now, because you effectively have a 2D plane and you have uh, surface areas that you know and you have uh, densities that you know as well, you can now use all the stuff together and you get the number of cows in the regions. Uh, you do this for all the regions, you add them together, and that's your Monte Carlo estimate for your cattle camp. You can do it over and over again for different samplings, for different contours, for small alterations, and effectively that's how you produce an estimate that has some sort of conf confidence threshold on your uh, simulation that relates to that cattle camp, right? Uh, so that's basically the way we kind of do it. We identify cattle camps, and then we estimate using Monte Carlo how many cows are in that sort of thing vaguely. Uh, so let's have a bit of a chat about the current work and the future plans that we have with this sort of stuff. Uh, first of all, there's some uh, improvements that we've been thinking about doing and we're implementing at the moment. Um, we want to kind of highlight some of the, uh, uh, let's say, weaknesses of this method, for example. Uh, so the current method is based over the sort of escalation that I mentioned earlier of a rough scan and a fine scan. Uh, the problem is that the first stage can be quite computationally expensive. And if you don't tune that stage properly, uh, your second stage kind of blows up in complexity as well. Uh, you need to reduce the false positives, uh, which is currently done by a confidence threshold. And we would like to do this a bit more natively. Uh, the plan is to basically train the sort of convolutional neural network to deal with the problem as an unbalanced data set. Uh, this in turn works and doesn't work and is still being developed right now. Uh, but there's another sort of thing associated with this entire sort of thing that the problem itself is limited in terms of the resolution, in terms of the features that you can extract from an image. Uh, similarly, on the estimation uh, side of things, the current Monte Carlo is quite simplistic. It can benefit from a bit more uh, sort of complexity and a, a bit more sort of extrapolation. It, it doesn't really take into account factors like herd clustering, so the sort of stuff that you would see normally in a herd, that you would get some sort of patterns emerging or some sort of directionality that is a bit more inbaked into this sort of macro scale, macroscopic behavior. Uh, and the plan on that side is to kind of further refine the model by employing a Monte Carlo Markov chain to kind of uh, imply these things that I was mentioning earlier. Similarly, we still need to validate this with respect to ground truth data and to make sure that our parameters are actually sensible to what we're doing and to make sure that we're not underestimating our biases and our uh, uncertainties. Uh, in terms of ground truth, uh, we've been working with the UNFAO, so that's the Food and Agricultural Organization, and we've employed a consultant to do a couple of things. Uh, one is to understand the South Sudanese livestock patterns, uh, as, as the thing that I've been talking about mostly is these cattle camps, but there are all the other sort of pastoral uh, uh, practices, as I'm sure you're more aware of me again. Uh, we're trying to acquire ground truth data to model the to model the uh, cattle camp number density, and similarly, we want to do this so we can validate our simulations and create a sort of baseline linear model, so we can actually say this with confidence that these are the scientifically accurate numbers based on this sort of method. Similarly, we're trying to understand patterns based on previously sub-identified uh, identified subpopulation zones, so it, it, these corrals that you can see here. But effectively, they're just animal pens uh, contained within these sort of large villages. And we want to understand how much of the, uh, what percentage of the agricultural sector are contained in these sort of enclosures as well. Uh, similarly, that being said, uh, I think this year, uh, South Sudan has uh, suffered from flooding and uh, 
some conflicts have broken out in the area and we need to reevaluate how much a, of an impact the cattle camps have uh, have suffered from all of that so that's another ongoing discussion that we're currently having with our consultant and it's further down along the line to kind of decide on these couple of things lastly let's talk about uh, a bit of applications and sort of conclusion conclusions i guess to kind of show you why you would want to use this and uh, how you could use it in the future when we do, do this uh, we aim to make this very modular and adaptable but i think we're already a good way with that uh, we want to package the code base and the methods to be modular and adaptable to any sort of problem that fits the mold so effectively if you have some sort of landscape you're trying to find some sort of clear defined features and if those features can contain a subpopulation of things that can be simulated by a simple geometrical placement this is something in there or if this sort of workflow somewhere in between you find something that's useful this thing should in terms you could just take it out of the box and just use it for your stuff uh, we aim to make this open source at the end of this when we're done with all the stuff make the data that we're doing for the low res imagery available along with the analysis code uh, we're going to publish it through github through an open source repository and we want the wider community to use this and inspect it and further adopt it for their own uses and hopefully bring improvements to this as time goes along. Uh, lastly, we want this to be scalable. We want to make sure that the performance of the standards and the analysis methods are you know, scientifically accurate and correct. And they scale well with uh, problem complexity and at the same time, they scale well with com computation resources. Yeah, so that's that's basically it in terms of applications. So we can kind of just wrap this up and just have a couple of conclusions. We've had a look on the benefits of these sort of uh, satellite imagery censuses. We've had an overview about the analysis method, what's the pros, what's the cons, what's the sort of stuff that's associated with it. Uh, we've seen a couple of the limitations of the, the methods and we've kind of talked about our future plans uh, regarding this sort of stuff. So yeah, that's that's me. Thank you for your attention, and yeah, I guess it's it's time for questions. If if anyone has any, thanks so much, Dan. That's fantastic. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, so you know, we've heard from you. This is a real novel approach for data collection. I think. It, what's nice is that it overcomes a lot of the physical challenges normally associated with collecting this kind of data. And obviously South Sudan is an extreme case, um, but I'm sure that our, our audience is probably interested in how this could apply in, in lots of different places, you know, in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in Europe and so forth. So I think, I think it's a really interesting approach and it's really great to see or to hear from you that it will all be open all the information and data and methodologies will be open and scalable. I think that's definitely in line with our whole uh, ethos um, for livestock data for decisions. So that's really excellent. Um, so yes, we have a nice chunk of time now for questions and answers. Um, and as Dan mentioned, um, especially technical questions, since that is his expertise. Um, if there's questions that you know uh, maybe he can't answer, he can you can perhaps uh, relay those to the right person and get back to us. Um, so my colleague, Kara is here. She's going to um, help field questions, um, starting with questions from the chat. But also this is, you know, we're friendly. So if you want to turn your video on and ask a question, all you need to do is raise your hand. And to do that, click the reactions button. So there's a ribbon at the bottom of the, the video screen the little happy face if you click that there's a reactions button you can raise your hand and then we'll call on you so uh cara why don't you let us uh into the first question great thanks vanessa and thank you dan that was really interesting okay so i've got some questions here vanessa maybe if anybody wants to jump in you can just interrupt me um the first one was from mateus i think we've answered this mateus your question was do you check the cow density simulations against any ground truth i think that was asked quite early on and I think Dan you've covered that. Uh, the second one was from Jane Poole. So Jane you asked did I miss a step where you first confirmed that the camp has animals then moved to estimating the number? So what Jane's thinking about here is 
How do you avoid overestimating by counting camps that only have animals at certain time points? Mm -hmm. Cool. That's a really good question, Jane. Uh, so basically, uh, at this first stage that I've kind of just talked about, this is just the low risk stuff, but it's just a, in a sense, it's a gross overestimate. Uh, the second stage, which is the uh, low, the medium resolution one, is the one that should in turn tell you if that cattle camp is in use and it has animals. Uh, the idea would be that you would take the same snapshots that you're looking at, look at the time series over a year, see if there's an, any activity. And if there is, that Monte Carlo simulation is actually uh, valid for that sort of thing. It, in the sense that I've kind of just, I've lied a bit to you in the sense that I've said for every camp you do this simulation, but since this uh, whole pipeline is not done yet, uh, that isn't necessarily the truth. The point would be that if you find a cattle camp, you then check against the time series to see if it's in use. And if it is, then you estimate it with the simulation and validate it with the high resolution stuff. I think if that makes sense, hopefully. Got thumbs up. Yeah. There we go. Okay, Dan, there's quite a few questions around differentiating between species. So Margaret's asked, how would you differentiate a cow from a similar animal like a buffalo? Um, we've also got um, how do we identify and differentiate the cattle from other species and can we identify smaller species? So again, this is this is the problem that I kind of tried to highlight at the start. We can't do this individual uh, for individual animals, right? You saw in the high resolution image, the best that you can get is these white dots. And the point is that we're not really counting uh, the cows themselves as we're looking at the landscape and identifying the cattle camps, and then just estimating how many cows are associated with that sort of thing. To kind of answer that sort of question is that if you wanted to do something similar for buffalo or whatever, you would effectively try and identify regions in which uh, buffalo graze and then write a similar simulation that encodes all the information on how the buffalo herd and cluster to kind of have something of the sort. So that's how this method would be relevant to that. But in terms of specifying each individual animal, we're not doing that. We're not looking at the high res images and just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're just going, we think, we think they're in here and we just think this is how many things are in there. And when I say we think it's, you know, it's a, it's a thorough uh, process. Right. Thanks, Dan. Okay, they're coming in thick and fast. So Jeff's asked quite a technical one. What is the rationale for using triangles in the MC detection? So uh, that's basically a tessellation. The reason why triangles is super simple when you think about it is because triangles have three lines. It's the simplest polygon you can draw. And because you have three lines, you can find the area. Uh, and effectively, whatever shape you can draw, you can always break it down into triangles. So that's called a tessellation. And that one that I'm using in this talk, it's a Deluni uh, tessellation if you're interested in. And another really good thing is that tessellations have been around for a while in computer vision and you're gonna find in video games, that's a very, very uh, classic thing that they do all the time. They break down complex polygons into triangles. Uh, you can just deal with them very easily. If you have something very complex and amorphous, it's very nice to break it down into small bits and pieces that you can deal with and triangles the simplest and the easiest ones to use and stuff comes out of the box out of the box very fast written in c plus plus that kind of goes with it that, that's it sorry <laughs> it's, a, it's a long rambly answer right thanks dan okay gareth asks can you extend this to animals that are kept in sheds rather than camps and how would you identify a cattle shed yeah that'll be that that would be the exact same problem that this sort of stuff would be amazing for uh, so I don't know if you've seen this, but Google tend to do this stuff that they identify buildings. So in that sense, if you had some sort of data set that you could train, what does a shed look like from a, from a satellite image? And then you can say, okay, I, this is my packing density in that sort of shed. This sort of, this sort of method would be amazing for that sort of thing. If anything, it would be, I wonder if it would be even surpassing this sort of stuff that we're doing because sheds are quite clear. They're very square. They're very, easy to identify in the landscape. Okay, All right, cheers, Dan. Okay, so Doug's asked, what is your intended approach for the high resolution surveys? So that's still down in the pipeline. Uh, uh, but basically that one is, I think the current plan for that is to 
validate our simulation and further improve uh, the accuracy because you can look at different features. You can look at the sort of, uh, I don't know, like huts that kind of show up in this sort of stuff. So you can distinguish between areas that the cows are more likely to be in and not likely to be in. And sometimes you can actually see like the wee white dots and you can actually just have like a sort of cross validation, but that's still further down along the pipeline. Okay, I understand. Okay, and Mateus, again, a bit more technical, or can you get a bit more technical regarding images you're using in terms of source resolution, etc.? So I think, so for the ones that I've been talking about in this sort of low resolution stuff, this is from uh, the Google Sentinel engine. So it's Google Earth Engine, Google Earth Engine, and it's the Sentinel imagery. And I think for the medium and the high resolution stuff, we were using Planet. So this isn't really my area, but that's why I know so far. And in terms of resolutions, the low res stuff from Google is 10 meters by 10 meters. Uh, and then there's five meters for the medium one, and there's 0.5 meters for uh, high res. But don't quote me on that. I, I'm a bit hazy on this. We, I, I've mostly been working on the low res stuff, so I can't, I can't really tell that with accuracy. But it's it's Google and Sentinel. If if that can answer your question. Okay, thanks, Dan. So one here from Alex. Good question. How would you account for transhumans? since at any given time, a huge percentage of cattle in South Sudan are moving and quite far from camps. So I guess transhumans is the migration patterns, right? Yeah, so yeah, how would you account for? Well, this is basically to do with the statistical estimation of the thing, right? Uh, when you do this entire sort of uh, pattern matching, you're effectively going, this cattle camp here is associated with some sort of herd. Uh, the entire time series analysis is supposed to kind of help you determine if that is consistent with the same sort of thing. And yeah, you, you're going to have to make, unfortunately, some assumptions at the end of the day that the same herd doesn't move through like three different ones. So if you have like three different uh, cow camps, hopefully you wouldn't have to cut a can for all three of them. But that's a very good question. And I think it's we're not at the stage at that point to kind of accurately answer that one. It's still kind of being developed. Uh, but I think the vague plan at the moment is to kind of incorporate it within the assumptions and just have uh, taken into account of the overestimates. Okay, brilliant. Jane, do you mind if I call you and just, you've got uh, quite a long question on this. Would you be okay just to ask Dan that? Oh, maybe Jane can't. Okay, so I'll go. I'll go through this, Dan. So this is from Jane. Cool. Um, although not very technical, she said she's wondering how components of this methodology could be applied to identifying communities. Could even use the animals to get there. She's thinking about projects of humanitarian or research or development, where highly mobile communities like pastoralists may not be able to a either contribute their voice, intervention activities may not answer what they need and be benefit from services or support. Then I guess there are ethical issues about looking for people, but at least if you could identify where communities might be would help inclusiveness. We often say we're working with pastoral communities for both research and humanitarian, but they're often the semi-sedentary communities. And she apologizes for that being so long. Okay, so I guess- so I guess that's lo looking at humans then instead of animals, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I am unmuted now. But uh, hi, Jen. Hi, I couldn't unmute myself. Sorry. But you read it out very clearly. I could have done it better. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Over to you. Okay, so it's how could you use this methodology to identify active communities yeah. in the landscape, right? Is effectively yeah. thing. I, I guess it's similar, right? It, it fits the pattern of if you can identify a village, you can then simulate how many people live in that village. Of course, there's ethical considerations on that sort of thing. I, so that sort of side, I could not really answer what would be the sort of yeah. Uh, it's, it's idea. more to do with it's more to do with these transhumans who are moving a lot. So um, I have two job hats, and one of them is more with livestock, and one of them is more with humanitarian humans. So, and both of them, you know, we have a we want to work with pastoralists, but if they are moving a lot, you're not their voice is not is not coming out. So it's it's more a case of ensuring they're included and whether you could use some of this methodology 
to sort of get a feeling for where the population is and yeah anyway. sure sure I, I think you could but similarly you would have to do this analysis for a time series in the sense that you would do you would identify these communities and then you would try and see how they migrate uh, towards the landscape uh, by doing this sort of analysis at a step-by-step -step basis. Uh, again, it depends on what is a pastoral community. Can I identify it from these uh, satellite images and so on? So it, it's a lot of, you know, it's a solid maybe. That's that's how I can, uh, I can summarize this. But un unless you have some sort of data to kind of have a clear statement about it, solid 50-50. Thumbs up from Jane. That's good. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to try and do my best not to miss anybody out. Um, and Kara, so I just I, want to mention something sorry. really quickly. Oh, is Tom. that um, Tom is yeah. Dan's colleague, Tom Wilkinson, welcome, is here. So he can uh, back you up. I think Dan's going to run out of energy if he gets so many questions. So we have uh, two people now to answer questions, which is great. And Tom, you've actually got your hand raised. Do you want to come in there? Oh, Vanessa, do you need to unmute Tom? Oh, Tom, we can't hear you for some reason. Yeah, it, it doesn't say you're muted, but we, we can't, you're not coming through. Do you want me to, I could ask Dan another question and let you try and Okay, okay, Dan, sorry, you're on your own again for a little minute until Tom gets us for a night. Okay, so Sintaryu from CIA to Ethiopia, what is the scale of the study area and how can you validate with ground actual volume? How can you identify the species and is the, what are the accuracy rates? So Quite a few questions in there. Right, that we, let's try and unpack that one. Uh, yeah. The first one is, I think we're the plan is to do this for all of South Sudan. Uh, we're currently, our training data set is, and our validation data set is a region around the Nile that should have enough variation to account for the whole landscape. Uh, so that's one. What was the second one? I've already forgotten. Hang on, I've already lost it. Two seconds. Um, how can you validate with ground actual volume? All right, so I guess this is the question regarding ground truth. Uh, mm -hmm. We're still acquiring ground truth data. And the point is that once you have a Monte Carlo estimate for a cattle camp, you can then actually compare it to the actual numbers with the associated error bars, and then you see how it is. I think another one of the questions was accuracy. Accuracy, what you uh, are. Yeah. I think we're still a bit far off from having that sort of thing because we still don't have the, the quality of the ground truth data that we have is very, very limited right now, and we don't really have estimates for that. So saying how accurate we are at this stage is a bit of a you know it's not really possible i would be i would be lying to you i wouldn't be giving you anything good to go by and that would be on a camp by camp basis as a whole aggregate there's another question of false positives and identifying them in the entire sort of thing but to kind of just maybe end it on an optimistic note uh from my experience with monte carlo simulations and with this sort of stuff you tend to get at least a order of magnitude in the worst case scenario sort of estimate. And the really good thing about these Monte Carlo models is that they're tunable. So there's very few assumptions going into them. And you can tune these parameters just by a tiny bit and your accuracies tend to improve quite a bit. And they tend, with the more data you have, the more you can validate them. And the more times you run these simulations, the smaller the error bars tend to go. I think that's, that's basically it. Thanks, Dan. Tom, I'll just go back to you. Are you okay to speak now? Do you still want to join the conversation? Um, he's writing to me that it might be an issue at his end. So oh. he's just typed a response in the chat, responding to Jane, that, that the team has been approached as well about using these techniques to identify temporary refugee camps mm -hmm. and inviting Jane to explore the question of mobile communities in more depth if they want to have a follow-up. Um, at the end of the session, I'll just put up the, the website for the team so you can follow up with anyone there. Excellent. Okay, thanks, Vanessa. Uh, Dan, so another question from Jeff Sim, University of Edinburgh. Is the resolution of widely available satellite images a constraint 
And if so, what is the timescale for future versions? Right, so in terms of constraints, it means what you mean, right? Is if it's just low resolution stuff, it's a constraint in the sense that you're limited by what you can see, right? It's by a 10 by 10 meter sort of resolution, you're gonna compress a lot of these things into one pixel and then you've lost a lot of information. Now, if you've got deep pockets, you can you can dig deep and get some high resolution stuff, and then your life's gonna be a lot easier. Uh, you know, you're gonna have a much easier time trying to estimate these things. But part of this project is to kind of get it to that stage and develop this sort of methodology that you can do something decent in the, in the worst case scenario with not a lot. Uh, right, that's that's basically it. What was the second part of that question? I think it was just what what's the future? future what's yeah. the time scale for future versions? Uh, good question. That one I couldn't tell you to be honest. A lot of the stuff is still in the sort of exploratory stages. Uh, I can tell you from the point of view of the code base that it shouldn't be very hard to package it. We've got it to a stage where it's 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 there, but we still need to go through a bit of an internal process to kind of come to an agreement where it's time to stop this exploration stuff and we kind of have to move it. I couldn't, I really couldn't tell you like a, a future date, but uh, yeah, it's it's basically, it, you would have to kind of follow this up with us and we update our blog posts quite regularly and we would make you kind of aware of this sort of stuff. Okay, okay thanks Dan. So Simon Holland asks, with the level of accuracy achievable, what decisions can this be used for? Maybe that's not that's, such a technical question. But... Yeah, that's a bit outside of my area. Yeah. But it's from what I understand, right, and, and the South Sudan stuff, uh, we tend to have two uses that we kind of identified. One is to estimate the contributions towards the total number of cattle. Uh, and the second one might be for something like if you want to inform a vaccination campaign, you get a map of these uh, cattle camps, and then you can actively simulate how many cows are in that sort of cattle camp. And then you can actually tell the people on the ground, okay, if you want to vaccinate uh, this herd, this is roughly how many vaccines you need to take with you. And this is where we currently think that uh, the herd is located in this area with this, 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 based on the data and the analysis. Okay, thank you. I'm um, from Chris Hilbrunner. How do the estimates that you're getting of cattle populations compared to current estimates? Again, that's not at that stage yet. It's okay. uh, we're still we're still kind of flushing this out. But again, intuition wise, it, it should beat the uh, extrapolation from fifty years ago by by quite a margin. As my well, I might just be <laughs> I might be you know a bit too overconfident, but yeah. And then another one from Chris, just leading on from that, are you considering seasonality and selection of imagery? Because this might reduce uh, the impact of missing animals who are migrating. I think so. So the current, right, this is kind of like, this feeds into two parts of this uh, workflow. It's one in this stage that we're kind of just doing this now as the pre-screening estimates. And secondly, it's taking into account in the second stage but effectively, when I say a time series, you're looking over an entire sort of year to kind of identify the use of that cattle camp. Now, the question that we've not really addressed and we still need to kind of look at is seeing these migration patterns and how they evolve in a certain sort of cattle camp and seeing if we can even discern between multiple sort of migration patterns and how do we kind of account uh, for all of them. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's still quite a bit far off for that one, but thanks for the, the thing. I'll, I'll keep it in mind and I'll make it out of it as we go along. Okay, Dan, I think there's just a couple left in the current chat. So, Sintayu CIAT Ethiopia has asked, please elaborate on Google and Sentinel data. That's as far as I know. So, Google right. is Earth Engine and uh, Google Earth Engine, I think if you just Google that, it should show up. And, uh, Planet is just a, I think it's just a provider, like a satellite image provider. So if you just look for uh, Planet satellite images, maybe I think is, is something of the sorts. So that's not something I'm really involved in. I kind of just treat it as it's, it's the data that we have. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks, Dan. And another one from Chris. Could you be specific about what ground truth data you're using? Is it drones or plane photos? 
So this is something I've really not been a, a part of for too long. And from my understanding, it's working with people on the ground and working with uh, vets that have delivered the uh, vaccination campaigns. Uh, that's why our sort of ground truth data is very sort of rough. We kind of have a bit of an estimate, like it's a bit of a rule of thumb thing, that someone went there and delivered about a thousand vaccines. So it's a bit of a, we need to do, not I wanted to say statistical trickery, but it's you have to look at multiple sort of these rough estimates to kind of get an idea on how well you can validate your Monte Carlo towards the thing. And that's why the Monte Carlo is quite good because you can have these independently sort of sourced things, which are quite rough to actually help you inform your decision on your model. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And Dan, I think that is everything that's come through in the chat. Please, <laughs> if I have missed, I know you did really well. Um, if I've missed anything, please, please jump in everyone or, or raise your hand and we can ask you. Yeah, and uh, people now can unmute themselves. So if you want to just raise your hand, maybe I'll even pick on someone who I know. Uh, Jawu Ku is here from the CGIR um, spatial community. Uh, Jawu, do you want to pop your video on and just uh, ask your question out loud? Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Uh, okay, good. Yeah, th thank you so much for this. A very in inspiring webinar. Um, and yeah, I thought we could also help sharing some of the uh, ground tracing data. So we are, yeah, I don't know then uh, if you, uh, how much do you know about CGIR? So we are network and system of agricultural research centers around the world. And yeah, a lot of colleagues, uh, my colleagues are also attending uh, this webinar today. And we could also uh, help collecting and sharing similar data from the ground and, and like from, for example, Jane uh, is also my colleague working in International Livestock Research Center based in Kenya, but she works a lot in Honolulu Africa region. So I think, yeah, so if you can give us, like, for example, some specification of what kind of data you are looking for and where and what kind of example that you could share, I think maybe we can develop some kind of data collection campaign and, and do it together in broader geography. So I think that would be interesting avenue that we can explore. Yeah, thanks. Uh, to shade. Uh, yeah, no, I, that would be something I would have to, you know, talk to my, to my manager and my boss and everything, and I would definitely get back to you on that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, it, that one's definitely, like, I need to have a think about it to, to kind of help you specify that sort of stuff. But I think if I, if I was to just answer this in rough lines is we're always looking for numbers associated with something in specific. So it's always good to that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I'll, I'll mark this up with uh, with Tim, uh, Tim Tom, and uh, get back to you at, uh, once we've actually figured out what, what we want to do. But cheers again, Jay. It does really, really good. Great. We have about five minutes. So um, any any more burning questions, big or small? Um, and remembering that Tom's also in the chat, so he can he can add any any more info. I think I see another question from Sintayu from Siat, Ethiopia. Um, Sintayu, do you want to pop your, are you able to ask your question out loud? Yes, yes. Great. Yeah, t thanks, Dan. That, that's really interesting, of course, to my interest area as well. Uh, so the question when I was asking about the Google and Sentinel data, basically the resolution that you used for the Sentinel data. And of course, when you say, Google, I mean, you know, Google is is Google. There's too much data in the Google. So what actual data actually you use from the Google? It's just for curiosity. But I, I really appreciate the entire work you guys are doing. Cool, cheers, cheers. Uh, so I think Tom just answers that in the chat. So that's the low resolution 10 meter by 10 meter uh, sort of stuff that we've been using in this talk. And this is accessed via the Google Earth Engine. So that's, yeah, the Sentinel is the API from the European Space Agency. Awesome. Okay, I saw another question popping up from Jeff Sim. Jeff, do you wanna, do you wanna make an appearance? Hi, sure. Yes, thanks. Really interesting seminar. Thanks very much indeed. 
Dan, uh, can you get thermal images from satellites, or do you need to be closer to the objects? Right, it depends on what you mean by thermal. If you just mean infrared bands, I think that comes with the sort of sentinel stuff, right? I'm not sure what I mean. Living animals, I suppose I mean. You know, right, the, right. the can you can you spot a cow from a cow-shaped tree, for instance? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you could, but you would need some drone or something that would be very low, oh, low okay. altitude. Like, I, I let, I'm, I'm sure there's some governments out there that have the capability of zooming in with some really high-tech infrared stuff, but the cost of that and getting access to that, I can imagine being absolutely impossible to get a hold of. So in that sense, yeah, you would need drones or something. Thanks. Great. And uh, there's a lot of nice chat happening, uh, people offering to help each other, which is great. People posting links. Uh, so Tom's posted a link to sciahub.copernicus.eu. I'm not sure what that is, but uh, have a look at that. And any Andy Cunliffe has, has also posted um, something related to that. So um, these are probably data sets that people can access. All right, we have about two, three minutes left. Um, well, we welcome any more questions. You can either just, just turn your video on and, and ask or post something in the chat. Doug McNeil's writing that IR data will be available soon. Satellite view or Aurora Tech. Okay. Great. And maybe what I can do is I can collect some of these links and then after the session, when we send back the session recording, I can include some of the links in there um, if people want to follow up on anything. And actually what I'll just do now is I'll share my screen because I've got the um contact details for dan's team so uh, if you see it there we have their website datasciencecampus.ons.gov.uk so you can find out about all their projects including this one and there's the email datasciencecampus at ons.gov.uk so i suppose if someone wants to get in touch they can write to that address and they'll get through to you so that, is that okay great um well, with that, uh, I really want to thank you all, especially Dan, uh, for this excellent discussion, wonderful presentation. It's been really interesting at a broad level. Um, I think we have a really nice mix of people in the room who, who participated, so we're really grateful for that. Um, and I want to thank you for participating in this Livestock Data Summer Session. And actually, the series does continue uh, next week. We have two sessions left. Um, the first one is the Rangelands Atlas, building the evidence base for better decisions. And they're actually working on building a Rangelands data management platform. I see some linkages potentially with what Dan has just presented. So if you're interested in Rangelands, if you're interested in improving the evidence base on Rangelands, definitely join next week. That's with Fiona Flintan from ILRI, International Livestock Research Institute. And the following day, we have our very last session um, in this series, uh, Tags from Text, an Automated Tool to Standardize Livestock Terminology. So for all of you who are interested in organizing data, data management, ontologies, vocabularies, and so forth, um, we're going to demo a tool that's been developed with our colleagues at the University of Edinburgh's Bay Center um, using some automation to uh, basically create tags from text. With that, uh, thank you very much. If you're interested in what we do with Livestock Data for Decisions, visit our website, livestockdata.org. We have data visualizations and more. You can sign up to the newsletter, follow us on Twitter, email us anytime, uh, and get news about future events, opportunities, and so forth. So with that, I'll end the session. Thanks, everyone, again, and we hope to see you again soon. All right. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Thanks a lot. <laughs>